Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Product Crunch. This is a very special edition, um, especially since I'm talking to you all from my living room. This is very high tech. Um, but really, uh, we're very excited to be talking to you right now and to be having this Product Crunch. It's um, our first uh, online edition. We normally prefer the live variety, but you know, special circumstances require special accommodations. So really welcome. Um, I know right now we have guests uh, you know, uh, viewing us from all over the world. We have colleagues and friends in Japan. I know we have a few people that are in Africa, specifically South Africa, that are watching this. Um, I'd also love to give a shout out to Elon, who's watching from home, and Beyonce, welcome. Um, so we're gonna have a lot of fun today. Uh, this is literally the best I've looked in two months. I took a shower. I'm wearing pants. Um, I even got my big hoop earrings on. My colleagues can um, attest to, you know, the range of my appearances on Zoom calls. Um, but unfortunately, we can't welcome you to our studio. But as always, um, these Product Crunch events are brought to you by Goodpatch. We're an international design company. We have about 200 people across studios in Japan, um, Berlin, and Munich. Um, we do UX, UI design, bringing you some of your favorite connected apps, as well as uh, design strategy, um, brand experience design, you name it. I'm, I'm happy to announce that this event, this is our first sponsored event. We're being sponsored by Adobe XD. Um, so with that, uh, we have an amazing giveaway planned. Um, this is more than the typical free bottle of wine or book. Um, so our viewers today have the opportunity to win um, one free year of the Adobe Creative Cloud. And if you're a designer, you know exactly how much that's worth. I don't have the exact number in my mind, but it's hundreds of euro. Um, so in order to win, because the value of the prize is so high, we have to up the ante a bit. So if you would like to win, um, our colleague Lissy will be on LinkedIn. Um, so if you tag Goodpatch, that's at Goodpatch, and hashtag Product Crunch in a post, maybe share a photo, an insight, um, or whatever you feel like, um, we're going to announce a winner at the very end. And you have to be online at the end to win because we don't have everyone's names, we just have your usernames. Um, so also, because we don't have free pizza and beer, I know that we're missing a lot of our favorite uh, grifters who just come for the, the free food and drink uh, at normal events. But um, yes, yeah, so today, if you would like to, you free, feel free to donate to Detafel. We have the stream in um, the chat, or the link, sorry, in the chat, um, and you can donate there. All donations will go to uh, minimizing food waste and helping people who are in need. So Product Crunch, for those of you who aren't familiar, we normally do this once a month at our studios in Berlin and Munich. Um, and today we're joining forces with our Munich team. Um, we do this once a month, bringing together the design community. We've done events around mobility, smart home. We've had sex tech. We've had hype. Um, and today we're very excited to have the borderless edition. I think that a lot of us are feeling now more and more that our Borders and boundaries, and those are both physical and abstract boundaries, are very, very present. We're all feeling very closed in. We're very limited to the space that we can occupy. We have to wear things that cover our faces and that keep everything about ourselves as contained as possible. Um, but when putting this event together, we realized that for the very first time, we could invite speakers from all over the world. And we realized that... Um, you know, the world is only as big or small as you make it. Um, so we're excited to expand our network and our audience today. Um, and that said, I'm very happy to introduce our very first speaker. Um, as most of you know, if you know Goodpatch, you know that we're a Japanese company. Our headquarters are in Tokyo. And someone from the Japan studio is joining us today, um, now in Emoto. He studied in the States. He's worked on a number of global uh, projects. And so today he's going to be talking to us about the differences um, in design in, both in Europe and Japan. So without further ado, uh, please welcome to the screen now. All right. Um, uh, let me... I'm gonna try to. Okay, so I think. All right. 
Okay, can you see the slides? Now you can see the slides or. Yes, now, now we okay. can see this. Oh, wait, we're seeing the, um, the work in progress slides. We're not seeing the presentation. Okay, okay. how about this? Are you seeing the presentation like a full screen? Yes, now we are. Okay, great. So, and it moves, right? Does it move? E yes, it's moving. Okay, great. So, um, it's very nice to meet you guys online. Um, I'm now, like Maya said. Um, so, today I'm going to talk about design in Japan and the West. So, differences between Japanese design and Western design. But before that, uh, let me let me uh, introduce myself real quick. I'm now in Omoto. I, I learned graphic design in the States. And after I graduated, um, I joined a good patch Tokyo as a UI designer. A lot of client work with uh, with many clients uh, from startup to many uh, national corporates. And the thing is one of the clients that I did uh, in the in the last summer, to think is one of the biggest healthcare application here in Japan. And since since 2015, uh, we have supported uh, Think launching the application or growth a strategy process, something like that. And we have done the overall design uh, coming along with those strategy. And now Think have ranked uh, the first on App Store and, and Google Play, which is really amazing. And the uh, One Career Cloud is the other client work that I did. So One Career Cloud is a software uh, for HR people to to hire new grads after they graduate. And with those with this software, you can analyze the competitor competitors' schedule and analyze the the student behavior with all with all data and like schedule or something like that. And you can eventually the plan, the better schedule for hiring. And we we have designed the the entire software we, and we did an interaction design and information architecture and user interface design and the actual development. So this is my uh, self introduction and uh, let's get into the main topic today. So what do you see in, in Japanese design? So they, they are my favorite design like of all time. Like it can be art, but it can be design. Like it's it's very beautiful design. And when you when you see something like this, um, you might say something like a flat or empty or subtle or clean or minimal or craft and whatnot. And when I did the research, I um, I found this theme in in, in, in the entire Japanese design. And, and that's a duality. And it doesn't really make sense until until you see this. So this is actual the Japanese design as well. It's a flyer. It's a web design. Uh, it's a it's an application. It's it's a scenery, but it's very cluttered with images and uh, the text and right it, a lot of columns, a lot of banners, and. Why those kinds of design exist in the first place? Uh, at the same time, uh, we we have the beautifully designed, just just like I I showed you, right? And then I picked the two biggest reasons for that. And the first one is definitely definitely the language. So in English, they have like alphabet and uh, digit, but in Japanese we have five types of letters like hiragana, katakana, kanji, and alphabet. And digit, and when you come like when you count the number of like letters in English, it's only thirty six letters. On the other hand, we have like more than two thousand two hundred like well more than two thousand letters, right? Which is way too many. But we have to handle all those letters in one design. And when you take a look at like sentences, sentences. This is a this is the description of like deep uh, deep sea fish, right? From Wikipedia, and you might notice something like this. So English is made up of many block of sentences, including spaces. But in Japanese, we don't have any spaces. So Japanese 
one single block as as a paragraph. So those differences make you make you see that the Japanese design is very cluttered and uh, with images and, and and letters and something like that. Although the the information the amount of the information is pretty much the same. And when you take a closer look at words in each language, so in English, there's a lot of like a visual uh, variety. You have like uh, old capitalization or italic or lower cases, but we don't have that in Japanese. It's just all very solid letters. So we have to rely on the decorative elements, right? So this is the different thing. Uh, this is my favorite uh, character in Japanese. And in English, it means stork. And now when you count the number of the letters, it's, a, it's S, T, or R, K. So it's five letters. But we can convey the same stuff in just one letter. That's a difference right there. So... Uh, uh, number of the character type and the visual density and the cued so information density is very very uh, big different and like when you think about Twitter it's very uh, reasonable because uh, in English you can tweet in 280 uh, letters although we can only tweet in 140 letters because like I said like information density in Japanese is pretty much higher than English so it's uh, it really makes sense and the second reason and this is also a really big reason is a, is a culture so i would definitely can say i, I can say um it's a it's a radical versus conventional and it, it comes from the races so when you think about races in japan the, although there there's a there's a too many people there's a lot of there's a lot of people 99% of population in just one race in Japanese, right? But when you think about the states, uh, there's a lot of races. So uh, like Hispanic people, like black people or the white people, or Asian people. So those are the differences have been an impact to uh, design. Yeah. So the second one is uh, image driven. This is very interesting, actually. So I picked up the two example here. So the left one is the left image is from Lakten. That's one of the biggest e-commerce website. And the, the right one is the Best Buy. That's also one of the biggest electric store in the States. But when you compare the ratio between uh, product images and description, it's very surprising and interesting. Just like this. So I covered each section with rectangle and, and you see the ratio like how big product images on the best buy compared to the description of the product so it's pretty much the same uh with uh europe it's a media market so the Mac, macbook pro is pretty bigger than the japanese macbook pro it's just funny but it's not only about uh, the e-commerce website. It's I, I'm sorry. It can also be applied to the movie poster. To the movie poster, this is very uh, noticeable, right? La La Land poster. Uh, La La Land and poster on the left. On the left. On the left. You only uh, you see a lot of like text and images, and the collection of images, and the cast name, which is very cluttered and busy. But on the right side. You only see just a title and the cast name and just images. So I can definitely say that the Western people are more driven by images than Japanese people are. So um, this is the, the different topic, but this is very this is I think the the most interesting um, stuff when I when I finished uh, the with the research the transparency. Well, it doesn't really make sense until now, but when you go to like the hairdressers in Japan, this is very interesting because you know you ask them to to cut your hair, and they be like they they like they explain every single step of the process. 
So they'd be like, I'm going to cut your sideburn right here. I'm going to cut your bang right here. Or like even after they finished, um, they'd be like, I'm going to put like a mirror right behind your head and so that you can make sure everything looks everything looks okay or something like that. So they need to be assured about every single stuff of experience. So when you go back to this example, the best buy in luck 10, right? I covered some sections here. I covered some some section with orange rectangle. And here, the best buy, it's a tiny section means about like uh, shipping. And it's it's the same here. But the size of the section about the shipping, it's pretty bigger than the state. So the clients, and I'm sorry, the customer need to know um, about everything until until they they make a decision to purchase the product. And like, and also like the peer pressure and the status status quo or something like that or psychological psychologic psychologic problem like something like that. It works here too. So this is the I think this is the time maybe right, but. There's actually other reasons, like ge geographical reasons, technological reasons, or other reasons. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, go over that uh, in in too much detail because time is running out. But definitely, well, the uh, because of the COVID nineteen, uh, I don't think you're gonna experience more like um, designing in Japan. But uh, because of you know the globalism, it's it's ending. But Maybe in case you design in in Japanese context or in Asian context, what what you what what you can learn from this presentation is one just very simple: the be familiar with the language, and the uh, two to get used to the culture, and the three try to convince them. So that's really what you need to do. So this is the end. That was the. Uh, the difference between Japanese design and um, the Western design. Hey, cool. Thank you. Now I'll give you a thank you a virtual round of applause. That's the one thing that I have to admit that I hate the most about these um, video calls is that because everyone's muted, I can never right. hear when people are laughing at my jokes. So I I feel a lot exactly, less funny. Yeah, I, I I feel lonely. <laughs> I feel lonely here. You're not alone. We're all watching you. Okay, great, uh, great, great. Yeah, cool. So yeah, if you have any questions, please drop them in the in the chat, um, and we will answer them. Um, but I guess while we wait, uh, one thing that really struck me was something you mentioned that or you said the globalism is ending, and that's so depressing. I mean, just and again, yeah. it's one of those things that we take for granted, right? Like, but yeah. um, but how do you? I mean. I know from what I know about Japan and like the work we do with our colleagues is something that's very uh, becomes very apparent very quickly. And as you just described, is that Japan is an island, um, mm -hmm. and so like everything that's in Japan is made specifically for for Japanese people and the Japanese culture. But like, in what ways do you think that like perhaps Western culture and influence? Like, where do you see those things influencing design in Japan? So, uh, so like American stuff influence can influence that the Japanese design is that um, yeah or European or like in what ways have you seen certain things changing? Is there something right. that I don't know if you have a specific example? Well, it's it's not a it's not about design though, but like in the history, our country was closed for like more than two hundred years in like back in the day, like you know uh, four hundred years something like that. Um, and after that, the states uh, asked that asked us like the open the country, and right after that, the, a lot of the culture is just was coming to Japan, and also like the in the history, right after the the, the end of like World War II, so uh, America tried to to colonize us, and a lot of culture like American culture were there. So I think it's not a design though, but our mindset was becoming more Americanized, I guess, uh, towards the 
uh, towards the the present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think so. Uh, I can't just name the one specific design though, but a lot of products were uh, influenced by those mindset that was changed with the influence of America. I guess. Damn those Americans! <laughs> oh, well, I mean, it's not. It, I'm not not talking. You know, I'm not saying something like that though. But you know, it's it's a fact. Yeah. And I, I like that though. I, I like the culture change. Yeah, no, it's it's funny. Like as an American, especially like living in Europe, it, it's fun to have that like different perspective. I think as an American living in America, it's really easy to believe that you're at the center of the universe. Wow. Um, yeah. yeah. But anyway, we move on. But so one of the questions was, um, someone would like to know more about the technical differences. Um, and like extended reasons about the Japanese culture compared to the West. So like some, I think that you'd, you'd sort of alluded to in your talk that there are different geographical right. and technical things. Right. Are there some technical things that you can um, sort of expand upon? Okay, um, so definitely I can say that one of the biggest techno technical uh, problem is uh, the speed of internet. So, um, in in 2000 i think in the, the last year the japan was ranked like 27th of all countries in terms of like how fast internet internet speed like mm. among the among the, um developed the country it's it's pretty low as a ranking and also like uh our the share ratio between the mobile and desktop or our the share for a browser like the in an internet explorer or the google chrome or something like that those like the problems definitely affects uh the website and design so for example they need to lower the size of the images as the banner right so that uh the uh the people can um, have access really fast to the website you know what I'm saying like mm -hmm. but well actually the lately those uh, those technical problems was really getting solved because mm -hmm. of the the technical advancement so I can't really say now it's very strong problem still but I think it, it still remains in some ways mm -hmm. it's also like a mindset I think right like you get used to things certain, working a certain way and then, you know, everything you have, you have to adapt around that and it's very hard right. to like retrain right. your mind. Exactly. But cool. yeah. Let's see. Are there any other questions? Let's see if any other questions pop up here. Hmm. Yeah, none so far. Um, one thing I would like to point out for the people who are watching, you might have noticed a weird little, um, and I'm going to embarrass myself, GIF. Is it GIF or GIF? GIF. That appears at the top, um, and that happens every time someone gives a donation. So please keep the donations coming in. They're all going to a good cause, um, and don't let it distract you. Um, cool, but let's check one more time. Any other questions? Last call for questions. Ah, here's one. Okay, um, this is coming from Boris, who you might know now. Okay, okay. And he says, he says you lived in the U.S. Um, can you better understand like the Japanese uniqueness? Like, how has that changed your perspective of um, Japan having lived in the U.S.? Right, that's uh, that's a good question. Um, I think, yeah, uh, I I started to think the Japanese is really unique country in the world right after I started um, to live in the States in a lot of way actually but um, well well there's there's too many to 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 pick up some um, man. well um, honestly like we like I said like a peer pressure is pretty strong here and like right after I went to the States like the, the the visual power is is so strong in, in 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 the states, right? So I think it can be applied. I can tell that it's the same stuff going on there in the Europe. So, but 
in contrast, like peer pressure is so strong in Japan. So those, like like I said, a psychological uh, stuff affects uh, their mindset for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so one more question is, um, someone says they see a lot more detailed design um, in Japanese design, and maybe he's just seeing the best. Um, but do you think there's more of an attention to detail and quality in Japan when compared to um, design that's created in Europe? But do you think there's more attention to detail quality in Japan compared to more than to brief would mean? Well, yeah, uh, that's kind of true, actually. Um, we really care about the detail, like, and sometimes more than we we should do. Uh, so uh, care, caring about a detail is kind of like a yeah, top priority uh, for us as a designer, for sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. So um, just really quick, also, if you see a weirdo walking around in the back, that's my husband. I wish it were a very cute child, but no, it's a grown man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> cool. So um, now, so thank you again so much now. I'll give you another no. big round of applause. Thank you. thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yes, it was fun. So we're going to move on to our panel now. Um, and I'm very excited to introduce the next panel. Um, this will be an idea we had reached out to Zandre, um, who um, someone we knew, who's a friend of one of our colleagues, and he's in South Africa. I know that he's in the process of moving to London should the uh, borders ever open up again. Um, but this is his idea to bring together a panel um, to speak to the great diversity in South Africa and all the different, uh, like the cultural differences, the different languages. Um, so we're very happy to have multiple perspectives with us today. Um, so I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves. Um, so, yeah, please. Cool. Uh, I'll go. Uh, my name is Caleb Chavalala. I'm a product designer at Founders Factory Africa, which is a venture capital firm based in Johannesburg, which is where I'm based as well. Uh, I've been in the design industry for the past 13 years and participating as what I guess you can define as a product designer for the past seven to eight years. And yeah, so I'm helping quite a lot of startups in the African continent with regards to uh, product design. Okay, I'll introduce myself second. Uh, My name is Zahira Ismail. Uh, I live in Johannesburg, South Africa as well. I've been practicing product design for about nine years and I currently, um, at the moment, I work for a company called Bleed Home, which is in the real estate industry. Cool, that leaves uh, leaves me. Uh, I'm a product designer for six years now. I currently stay uh, in Johannesburg, um, but uh, we'll be moving to the UK uh, pretty soon. Um, yeah, I currently work for a UK startup uh, in the education field, and um, hoping to inspire kind of the next generation of, of STEM learners. Okay, great. Um, cool. Uh, so I guess, I don't know about the other viewers who are watching, but personally, I haven't really heard too much news about how the coronavirus is uh, progressing through Africa. Um, could you tell us a bit about the situation there and how it's affecting your lives and work? Yeah, sure. So I think as of yesterday in South Africa, we're looking at close to like 8,000 confirmed mm-hmm. cases. We have almost 3,000 recoveries, which is great. Uh, I think we're looking at around about 158 deaths. Uh, how it's affected work, uh, I think we're on level four now, which means we've resumed some sort of like movement and activity. But I think the big thing for me is just the consumption of time in the remote interaction is so different from like real time. And so true. some of the spontaneous conversations and coffee breaks that are the pillar of like culture in the workplace are now like intentional and an effort and they have to be organized. Uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Sure, go, Andre. <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was going to say that I think that the uh, the biggest thing here is that um, even though in the in kind of the tech space, uh, remote work is is quite um, normal. Uh, I think that all the days kind of start blending together when it's when it's just the kind of an endless barrage of working from home. Um, so yeah, definitely feeling the the culture um, 
you know, kind of sucking the culture out of out of the work environment. Yeah, um, the the first difference, though, um, obvious, most obviously, is that our government was quite militant about um, you know acting quite quickly and taking absolutely no risks. Mm. Um, and that's quite funny because the response was twofold. I mean, at first, everyone was really proud that our government was so on point. And then uh, once the lockdown was extended unexpectedly and the cigarettes and the alcohol didn't come back immediately, there were accusations of dictatorship thrown around. Um, but, you know, like the rest of the world, like Zandre mentioned, we, we're too practicing social distancing, we're remote working um, where we can, and also taking a real, uh, you know, knock from the economy in terms of job and financial security. Um, in terms of how it's impacted work uh, or design specifically, I think most, like, obviously, it's turned to use a behavior on its head. Um, at best, people now have an abundance of time. They're saving more. They're spending less. Um, they're also getting really creative. But at worst, they're filing for unemployment. They're also, you know, suffering existential crises, mental health issues, and a lot of the time just going homeless. Mm. Um, in terms of where I work, particularly at Lead Home, uh, we've had to dress drastically, you know, pivot from business as usual um, and employ some drastic measures to save us from a drowning economy. Um, in real estate, you can only show um, houses virtually, and even then we've had policies that sales are subject to physical viewings at the moment. Mm. So we've had to really get creative in advancing real estate to virtual territory, and the same goes for a lot of other businesses. Um, the pandemic has really forced our hand in transforming industries that rely quite heavily on the free movement of people. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, I, I think that's a great time for creatives to prove, you know, their skill. Um, that it's not a non-essential skill, but rather a means of um, solving problems in unexpected and critical times. Um, but also, needless to say, uh, we have no access to users for face-to-face -face interviews or contextual inquiry, which really sucks because, you know, watching people's bodies are the best source of information. <laughs> you know, you make an excellent point that like all of a sudden your your sort of user journeys and your user profiles are now completely different. And now do you completely remodel your product to fit those profiles and those journeys? Or do you sort of wait it out and hope that actually things return to normal so that you don't have to do anything drastic on your end? I don't know, do, do um, Caleb or, or Zandre, do you want to say something about this? Uh. Yes, that, that, that is quite interesting um, and a very interesting question. And since I'm in the venture capital space, you can imagine that like, I've got exposure to multiple businesses at the same time uh, that have like this business models that were affected. And you, you do have to kind of like pivot quickly, uh, look at your user behavior, how it's changed. And in, in most cases, we've leveraged uh, most of the businesses in like the health uh, tech space to help with the fight of COVID-19. So, yeah. I also, I also wanted to add there that I think that the the speed of, of the product teams uh, becomes also quite essential, you know, depending on how uh, agile product teams and, and how quickly they can actually roll out uh, these sort of COVID-19 products, um, mm -hmm. you know, at, at scale to actually make sure that you're, you're reaching those, those new kind of user uh, archetypes or personas at, uh, at, at scale. Mm -hmm. um, j just to add to that, uh, a lot of interesting things have been happening this side as well. Things like insurance companies that have that, that kind of agility. Uh, I know of one example where you know they, they've enabled you to pause your your insurance if your car is at home and it's safer than it would normally be. You know, it doesn't make sense for you to continue paying your premium, which which I think is great. So we're seeing a lot of innovation from those businesses that are able to kind of uh, uh, pivot quickly. Yeah, that's great. Love to save some money on insurance. Um, so something I know that we're all sort of dealing with right now, depending on where you live and your current at-home setup, some people were. Um, perhaps insightful enough or they'd had careers in the past that require they work at home. So they have pretty good working from home setups. But I know that a lot of us, you know, we're either having to makeshift desks and workspaces, but then we have all these technical challenges. Of course, there's a lot of strain put on the system right now because so many people are using 
internet all day that maybe weren't before. Um, and I know that, um, that in South Africa, there are some infrastructure challenges and issues, and perhaps it's not as reliable as it is in some other places. Um, but how has the sort of infrastructure, specific technical infrastructure, how does that influence your design, your work and your practice, and also the, the products and solutions that you create? Cool. I'll I'll take the I'll take the first uh, first ones. So the um, I think uh, infrastructure in South Africa uh, is very interesting because uh, we have a very kind of left uh, socialist uh, angle um, to how we we run things. So there's a very strong government involvement in, in sort of electricity, um, universities, things like this. So um, I think that in terms of design work, you'll you'll almost never find. Um, uh, in my work with with UK companies, you often find that a lot of the products are almost purely digital. So they have they have they're connecting to audiences, and there's a platform, and, and maybe they they make some uh, they monetize on the transaction. Where in South Africa, you almost always have like a service angle as well, because there will always be some part of your um, your your user journey or or some part which is um, either manual or physical or needs a human interaction. Because those APIs and those integrations to to make things instantaneous with like banks or home affairs or things like that, uh, they, they they kind of um, don't always exist. Uh, so so from my personal experience, that's that's what I've I've found. I don't know if you guys have have, have other experiences as well. So I think South Africa has multiple realities depending on where you are geographically. Uh, I think if you're in the big economic hubs like Johannesburg and Cape Town, you'll have a fairly decent infrastructure all around. So depending on what kind of organization you are, so if you're a small startup trying to create a food delivery business, you might use those infrastructure challenges as constraints to go, I'm going to operate only in this area. Um, it becomes interesting when you're a big organization and you're providing an essential service that needs to reach everyone. And I think to Zandra's point, product designers find their, their roles a little bit like uh, wider than they, they normally are in the rest of the world, where you have to worry about support and all these other pillars that will support the, the digital product itself. Uh, I think data infrastructure, like Zandri mentioned, is a very interesting one as well. Uh, but uh, with that said, that there's a lot of like opportunity, and I think the opportunity lies in the, the digitization of core functions. Uh, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of opportunities for designers to be the first person to do something because it was never digitized in the first place. So I always try and imagine this, uh, which is a bit of a challenge, like if Uber had to digitize the maps of the entire geographical space that they wanted to start their operations in. And that's the situation that we find ourselves in sometimes. And sometimes it's easy to do, sometimes it's not yours to own, so you have to wait for someone to do it, or sometimes it's really big for the, for the, for the size of the startup that you're working in and you, you don't have that capacity. And, and those are the kind of challenges that we have to deal with, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. Yeah, just just to add on to that, you know, it's it's definitely true. You know, with device sizes, you've got internet, languages, um, challenge of transport, airtime, even electricity is often, uh, you know, the, a luxury. The bulk of us, when I say us, I mean the majority of South Africans just cannot afford. Um, in fact, researchers from Stats they found that like of the 7.5 uh, million households in major metropolitan areas approximately 28% are living on less than about like 2,500 Rand per month, which is just, you know, about 2,000 Rand under the extreme poverty line, which it refers to the amount of money that, that an individual will need to afford the minimum required daily energy intake. And on top of food, households still prioritize a bunch of other things, you know, transport to work or school or whatever it may be, electricity, education, then there's burial insurance and uh, the repayment of debt, which they've incurred because they've been um, trying to get loans for these expenses. But even after those, you know, there's a myriad of other, you know, es essential expenses which households must cover, um, not feasible food and domestic and personal um, hygiene products. Um, and it's clear that on low wages and low grants, these expense costs, you know, they're well afford, uh, um, well beyond the affordability capacity of most households currently living on low incomes. Um, and they need to cut back on food, which is one of the few expenses they have some level of control over and, and take on debt to cover the expense um, shortfalls. 
But interestingly enough, um, during this time, there's still been been an, uh, like a significant adoption rate of smartphones, even in the lowest income income groups. You know, while high end smartphones like you know the Samsung Galaxy and the Apple iPhone they're dominating the news, the more affordable smartphones are dominating sales. So today, about I think it's about um, like 20 to 22 million people in South Africa are using a smartphone, which accounts for about one third of the country, country's population. And it's expected to grow. I mean, I don't know how the pandemic is influencing all of this. Probably it's going to put a dent in that number. But I think the projected number was um, 5 million through till, till 2023. Um, and the overall number of mobile connections, the, that's just smart devices. But the overall number of mobile connections in general is more than about 90 million. And mostly because feature phones are still really popular and widely used in the country and, and on the continent um, overall. Um, so it's because of that that we need to design for the lowest possible uh, denominator and then scale upwards instead of the other way around. We're always looking for the smallest device sizes, the lowest quality devices, um, the least internet connection and electricity and to get around those um, challenges. But if you ask me, it's actually less to do with the hardware itself than um, as Zandria and Caleb mentioned, um, it's more to do with data. And for a country that relies so heavily on data, we actually have some of the highest data costs in the world. Um, but because of these limitations, and there is a silver lining to this, we see South Africa as just another African example where technology is an enabler and not a dependency. Um, so in other words, if a cell phone network goes down, you know, anywhere else in the world, businesses usually come to a halt. But in Africa, we just keep on going. The internet goes down, um, businesses usually come to a halt, but we just keep on going. And if the electricity cuts, which it does really often, like businesses come to a halt, but not for us, you know. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, internationally speaking, our pursuit of efficiency has made us kind of slaves to uh, technology. But in South Africa, this lack of complacency has bred kind of a unique um, culture of really pushing creativity when solving problems. So I can give you like, like really inspiring examples. You know, we have um, a lot of informal settlements and they don't have addresses or any kind of formalized uh, location. So when people apply for a loan, for example, uh, they describe the address as something like the, thir the third house by the big tree or whatever it is. Um, but that's worse. Um, what's worse is that um, if someone's in trouble, emergency service providers can't locate them. They can't get to them. Um, and the rest of the world would rely in this instance on GPS coordinates and, and you know, typical navigation technology solutions. But in South Africa, we're forced to rethink basic navigation in that context. So, for example, Gray Advertising, which is an advertising agency here, they did a project called Satellife based off a simple insight that no one in the township has an address, but everyone has a satellite TV. So, like, that's all you see driving past. You've got to drive past the township. So all they did was spray paint house numbers on those satellites for emergency vehicles and services to easily identify. Um, really simple but interesting solution to get around that technological challenge. Another example is that a lot of apps are now whitelisted to accommodate people's inability to, to purchase sufficient data. Um, for, uh, so the African cell phone network provider, MTN, for example, they whitelisted Wikipedia, which gave students, they gave students free ebooks. Um, they've also done projects where they sponsored free digital classes so that students who don't have access to electricity or internet excel in the digital world. And uh, similarly, a Cape Town based, um, I think is a print on demand startup um, called uh, Paperwrite, made all sorts of books available in outlying areas by allowing photocopy shops to print them legally from a wide range of publishers. Um, so this kind of thinking illustrates that um, only when technology is accessible can it provide, you know, utility. Um, here we have NGOs that have to be data providers, banks need to be telcos, healthcare players, um, in some instances use car parts, uh, you know, and they have to be car parts dealers. I think it was in um, a story about incubating babies with used car parts. So for Uber to create impact, for example, they would have to be in the business of building roads. Um, in South Africa, design needs to help brands, you know, be more than just sponsors, but enablers of, of impact. And I think that's the biggest difference. That's amazing. I, I like the way you ended that. That's such a nice way to sort of encapsulate that. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning of the panel, there's a huge range of diversity in cultures and communities across South Africa. Um, could, you, could you speak a little bit about this great diversity and how do you ensure that your design fits into these multiple communities?
Um, sure, uh, I'll take this one first. Uh, I, I think the, the diversity and designing for this diversity is a very interesting topic, just because of the history of the country and the way that it's made up, uh, where I think the different classes in the country do not like often interact with each other. We refer to specific groups in a number or percentage, but you know, we kind of like designing these people never having walked a day in their lives. And when you say designing to fit multiple communities, you are talking about designing for the communities that you are aware of. And what I mean by this is if you ask an architect, is that a nicely built house, he'll say yes, and it's got steps in the kitchen. But if that architect had someone who is in a wheelchair in their family, they would see that as you know, not being good enough. And the, 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 the reason for this, I think, is the diversity in teams. I think we have a, a very big country and it is, I, I do not expect it and I don't think it's possible for, for designers to be able to reach everyone and to go and do ethnographic research in the deepest of rural areas when they're working on products. What I think is really important to think about is how do we have inclusion in our teams so that all the non-serviced and underrepresented communities have a voice even if it's in the form of someone who comes from that community and goes, you know, there is the specific group of people that also use your product. Have you actually thought about that? And I think that is the interesting view that I have um, uh, about the country and, and the way that it's made up in terms of like how the communities uh, interact. Actually, I wish they could interact more with, <laughs> with one another. Yeah. Yeah, also, I also wanted to mention that there's a, um, there's a big focus, I think, on, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not necessarily sort of language and, and cultural differences that, that are the biggest uh, impact. It's almost the class difference, which is really the, um, the big differentiator on, on a product level. Um, you, you have to think about how different classes are, are, are using this product. Um, and I think that it's something that we, we aren't necessarily doing enough. Um, I, I don't think across any team uh, in South Africa that we're actually going and saying, you know, does this cater for the, the majority of South Africa? I think it's, it's easy to say, like, you know, our, our design is inclusive culturally, but very difficult to say our, our, our design is inclusive uh, in, in the classes that, that exist in South Africa. I would just like to add to, to what Andrea has said. Um, I think South Africa, for me, growing up, was, was uh, characterized by these big signages that repeated the same thing three times in three different languages. Danger, Khafar, Ingozi, so like <laughs> all the different people. And we kind of lost that, right? These ATMs where like when you insert your card, you would have 11 official languages and you select your own. Or you'd wait on the phone waiting for your language option and it's sitting at like number nine or whatever the case is. And most of those things have disappeared. And I think part of the reason could be we're trying to play catch up. Uh, most of these industries are going through digital transformation with uh, very limited resources and we want to get products onto customers hands and we compromising in inclusive design for speed to market uh, and, and i think that is something that as the industry grows we will we'll go back into and, and, and rectify uh, the implications though of not designing inclusively in south africa are, are very very serious because you, you, there's nowhere to hide. By choosing not to design inclusively, you've automatically participated in widening the gap between the people that have access and the people that have not, which is a uh, design ethics dilemma that to have as a designer, given the, the limited resources. Yeah, Caleb, actually, like, uh, just to add on to that, like, I think actually a lot of people just get away with it. I mean, the implications are really dire, but because of that class distinction and the cu cultural claustrophobia, I mean, people are really tense. They want, you know, they, they've got stuff to talk about, but it's difficult to talk about and they've got different narratives and people don't know how to breach um, those cultural contexts. So it becomes a really tense conversation. So I think perhaps like... Um, it's, it becomes, uh, it paints a very unique social landscape that South African designers need to navigate through on the daily very carefully and, and one that they're also, you know, subject to, they're part of. Um, for example, most directly, it's extremely difficult to unbias yourself um, as a designer, as part of that mindset, to think from someone else's perspective in order to design for their values and their behaviors, um, to think from, um, well, second to that, it's difficult to breach boundaries and get access to those perspectives. 
um, because people are so tense when it comes to the cultural exchange, like I said. And, you know, thirdly, it's to then promote a healthy design culture where, where communities can be spoken about without bias. Um, as a mixed race, uh, you know, person of, of color and Indian heritage, I can vouch for this. You know, per personally, it's always been a nightmare to speak about my identity or any identity politics when it comes to representation on a billboard or a landing page. It's 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 always such a uh, such a tense conversation, even academically and with the most you know open-minded design teams and communities. I mean, Zandre and I, myself and Caleb didn't never had a conversation about like where the hell do you come from, and Zandre and myself to an extent, but not before this moment we're like actually we're supposed to be thinking about designing for south africa where do you come from dude like what is your name um what does it mean you know but you know avoiding the difficulty of this often means that designers end up doing a whole uh, like a couple of other things i think mainly um and they're both they're both a little bit dangerous i mean it's either resorting to safe narratives or stereotypes which is like puncturing the tension with how beautiful or funny cultural clashes are or we're just subscribing to interna international standards where we ignore the whole thing entirely because, you know, obviously stock voters are doing it right. Um, and both are coping mechanisms, but like I said, neither are actual meaning solutions. But I, I do think we're getting better. I don't know what you guys think about it, but I do think we're getting better. It's, it's actually surprising how diverse an average office looks like these days. And it, it, mind, uh, mind you, it isn't a true representation of the demographic composition of this country. We've got 80%, you know, black people. Um, it is representative of our diversity, though, um, and that's the first step to basically acknowledge that these people exist, um, acknowledge our own biases when designing for them, and then fight to include them at all with a very strategic and diplomatic conversation. Because it, it, I don't think it comes naturally to people, at least in my experience or what I've observed, for a lot of stakeholders, especially those in power. Um, and then it's about really taking the time to understand those people um, and the discrepancies between each community or demographic type, whatever you want to call it, their values, languages, the level of digital literacy, access to facilities. I think like Caleb mentioned, we, we live so closely together, but we are so drastically different. Um, and we never get to cross those boundaries because of that, that tension. Um, so what we think the next person is experiencing is, you know, usually not at all what the reality of the case is. Um, it's about getting used to speaking about these things quite honestly in a tense setting, sensitively, objectively, and also with the, the utmost uh, self-awareness. I think that's um, it's so true. And I think, you know, when you're talking about like these different cultural translations, how do I make something, how do I take this American product to make it useful to people in Japan or in South Africa or wherever. But I think that also a lot of people, you're sort of scared to bridge that gap. Like, how do I talk about this in a way that is not offensive, that's not isolating, but then also, you know, it's not just a survey. I can't have someone tick a few boxes to tell me all about themselves. Like you really have to spend the time with these different communities and cultures to understand them you know you have to you know sit through an entire meal to really understand the context around what that meal sort of represents but sort of to this point um you know design in in many places in most places is still sort of um it's something that's reserved for the more privileged people that either had parents that exposed them to design or um, had some type of experience or were able enough or able to go to some type of a private or more elite institution. Um, for the most part, design classes aren't made available to people in perhaps lower income or the people that are going to public schools. Um, so how do we as a design community, and if you know we find ourselves in the position of privilege, how do we um, sort of reach out and make sure that the sort of the pipeline for talent is still open for anyone who might be interested um, from that first moment of awareness all the way down to, you know, you know, getting your degree in design um, and also the creating these cultures of inclusion so that people feel welcome, right? You can have a diverse team, but if people feel cut off and like they aren't welcome, you're not going to get, you know, their, their, their best selves there. So how can we do this? How can we make it better? Zandri, uh, as the white man, you can uh, you can take this one. <laughs> well, thank you, Zahira. No, I was I was going to say that I think the um, I think the biggest problem is not necessarily the knowledge uh, part. I think the the um, 
you know, boom of the internet um, kind of democratized a lot of the, the knowledge, but I think it's the, the hardware and the tools that is the biggest, biggest kind of blocker. It's like paying for design software, having a computer that can run it, you know, though, I think those are, those, are, those are big blockers. Obviously, if you want to go the formal education route, it's also, you know, three or four times more expensive than, than you would go for a, like a, a public university uh, degree. Um, design degrees are, are notoriously expensive, but I think the knowledge has been democratized to a, to an extent. But but I would say that the biggest thing we can do is is try to, you know, um, maybe the open source community or, or or someone in that space having um, opening up the tools for design. I mean, if you if you just look at sort of the illustration tools and and the design tools, they're moderately expensive, and then you go to like three D modeling tools, and then it just you know blows up. Um, Price-wise, and then you need specific computers, and and you know if you were an illustrator, you need a tablet. And I think that that creates a big gap between um, people who might not have access to enough funds to to buy the tools to actually um, become good at the craft. Because ultimately, I think it's a lot of practice in the design industry. Like, if you want to be a good designer, then design a lot. And if you don't have the tools to do that, I I don't. It's going to be hard to to get to the level, regardless of of the type of education you have. Uh, cool. I, I have a, a, an interesting view on this, uh, which supports Zandre, but just takes a step back uh, to go. Uh, the, the people that we're talking about, if you think of the narrative and, you know, the, the motivating factors, uh, it, it's playing catch up, right? So we, we're talking about people that come from families that are chronically poor. And they, you can only imagine that their motivation for a career prospect is something that's going to eradicate poverty. So career prospects are things like, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a this, I want to be a this. And design historically has just not been that attractive. <laughs> and we need to change that narrative, right? I think it was the Harvard Business Review that said uh, data scientist, the sexiest job of the 21st century. And I was looking at every video trying to become a data scientist for the, that week. <laughs> and I think we, we need to kind of change the narrative about design firstly the definition of creativity. Every time I go, hey, there's a career in design, people go, I can't draw. So they need to understand what creativity means in, in, in this context. Uh, secondly, uh, I think if we, if we have the same enthusiasm, the same effort that people put into finding themselves sitting in a first year class of medicine, in design and tech, a lot of the, the other things are going to sort themselves out. Uh, I think we can start talking about tools and communities and how do we help them. But I think if we get people to to want it, to to love it, uh, and and I, I building tools around it and building communities is almost as ridiculous as claiming that if you put the library online, people are going to read more. You know, like <laughs> they they need to desire that knowledge, they need to want it uh, because people would still spend time on uh, on, on social media. I want to argue that a video on Udemy or YouTube about design. It's probably the same bandwidth as a video of something really random on Facebook. And people would ideally have access. It's just a matter of making it something that people would want and desire. And, and I think that's where the story needs to start and then it will unfold. Yeah, um, like I completely agree with you guys. I do think it's a it's a class thing. Um, completely the hardware is a, a huge blocker because we're doing some things, you know, we 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 now see a lot of designers coming to the workplace without an extensive elite um, academic education. And we're seeing them adapt really quickly, often becoming so much more experienced just because they, um, they're so much more representative of their audiences. They're so much closer to the practice. Um, and because of where they come from, they're so much more creative in defining new and fresh narratives and standards of design tailored for their context. Um, and, you know, people, uh, we actually have a strong, really strong design culture in South Africa um, that isn't formalized. It, um, people have always relied on their creative skills to work around a given dependency on exclusive facilities in order to make ends meet. It just clashes with the formalized, um, you know, the, the academic discourses of, of design and, and the arts. Um, and I think it's because of this, you know, situation that we, you know, as designers, we love to sit and talk about uh, you know, gradients and, and, and 3D art and, you know, whatever it is, minimalism. But we really need to get our hands dirty in looking at the problems that are right next to us and um, solving for those within our specific context. And unfortunately, you know, because the narrative is different, like I said, 
Um, and there's no incentive to do it. Like Caleb says, firstly, it, it's completely unattractive, I think. Um, the only thing that's attractive about design is that you become this hotshot, um, you know, uh, Apple designer with a, with, with a turtleneck. Um, and if you're not doing that, it's, it's not really cool. Um, and unfortunately, on the other hand, you know, government work and getting really down and deep and dirty in the trenches isn't really incentivized. Um, and there isn't really opportunity for that that isn't well rewarded. Yeah, yeah it's very true. Uh, sorry. Sorry, no, I just wanted, I just wanted to say that I, uh, I, I really echo um, Zahira's sentiments of this kind of um, romanticizing of the, of the West uh, and, and the design coming, coming from, from Europe and, and from America. But I do think that there's this, there's this great um, kind of boom happening in the last few years where um, I think like African inspired design uh, has been taking kind of the world stage. And, and I'm kind of referring to uh, Karabu Poppy who, who had, uh, um, she did a design for a Nike shoe and it was actually um, Michael Jordan who showcased his shoe. Um, and, and I think somewhere was there was a there was a shot of him wearing the shoe. And I think that there's this there's this people are kind of going you know let's solve design problems in a in, a, in an African way or a South African way. And I think that's that's really special. And I think it's great. Thanks to Black Panther. Um, so a final question for me. Um, what do you hope the international design community takes from this crisis that we're in? Like, what do you think we can look forward to coming out of this? And I think, like, um, and it can either be the international community or perhaps the South African community. Um, but, yeah, what do you hope we take away? Um, I, I think the COVID-19 situation is obviously transitory. What I think is here to stay is the behaviors. Uh, they, they're going to stay behind, especially during during the transition period. There, there's going to be a boom in, in demand for design, firstly. Secondly, I think the global war for talent is going to be big. I think that we kind of proving that remote work is possible and that might attract more talent in, in, into, into the space. It might be more rewarding. It might push the prices of designers up, which is, which is great, all great for the industry. Um, I think the most important thing is changing the ideology with our stakeholders and our partners where we work with regards to remote working, because I think there's a lot of problems that we could solve with remote working. Carbon emission, traffic on the roads, and, and those kind of things when we're working remotely at this mass scale. And I think those ideologies will, will stay behind and people might see value in things like remote working even post uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Zandra. You can Sorry, okay. Um, <laughs> I suppose you gave me the floor. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. We're forced to engage in digital, digital channels on a scale more than ever before. Um, and I think this also has a result of it, like exposing all the UX uh, flaws that might have previously been dismissible or a nice to have. Um, you know, for example, you've got like I've observed like a lot of people raging about Google Hangouts um, uh, in place of other, you know, video software, whatever it is. Um, and it's why people will pay more for a product that is differentiated by ease of use, especially when people are using it quite repetitively. I, I also just wanted to mention, I think the um, this idea of, of user research um, you know, from a from a remote point of view, is is really tough. Um, I mean, uh, we we had an interview with with some high school students uh, who use our product. Um, one and one girl was in Kenya, and and the uh, uh, the other the other boy was in um, in the UK. And uh, it it was such a kind of a bizarre experience of trying to like use it to test an app where you can't kind of have them drive. So you're driving, and then you're asking them what do they want you to do, and it's this weird kind of um, probably bias uh, testing uh, experience. And so I think that there's, I think we could potentially look at, you know, sourcing way more candidates for user tests because people will be solving these problems during this coronavirus period. You know, how do you test with somebody in Australia if you're sitting, you know, in South Africa or, or, uh, or similar, similar kind of um, distances? Um, so yeah, I think I, I hope that, you know, some of those, those kind of researchy kind of um, things that you have to do Maybe could there's new tools and methods that that 
at Git Developed to, to help us with that. I like that point, Zandre. I think agility is going to be a big thing during the, the transition because if you're moving from level four to level three, the way that people interact with your product is going to change completely over a short space of time. And products will need to actually pivot really quickly. So I think we're going to be exercising that agility and then just becoming better. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you. So um, we can only take a couple questions from the audience in the interest of time. Um, so one, and I have to preface this by saying I don't necessarily know the products that are being addressed here. Maybe you do. Um, but the question is, what three words service um, has become has had great adoption in Europe, um, especially in the mobility sector? Um, they wonder if there has been much uses much usage in Johannesburg and uh, to help with delivery where customers don't have that traditional address. Do you know what um, what three words is? Yes, uh, I do. Uh, and it has. Uh, so I know that there's an emergency service. I just don't remember the name of Hot that is using it uh, for places that don't have a, a good address system. Uh, for them to be able to to attend to to medical emergencies uh also i think i've seen on an e-commerce website where i wanted to check out and those three words was actually an option for me to use as an address so there has been adoption from the provider point of view i'm not sure from a customer point of view because i haven't seen like any signs outside of people's houses and stuff like that i think the design in Daba had an initiative to kind of like promote it and was printing out like these uh, uh little stickers with 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 the three words on it i don't know if like the design community was the right audience uh but yeah it, there is some visibility of those three words in south africa mm. Okay, um, any other questions? Looking through this. Um, I think if not, I, I just want to, so we can bring everyone back now um, to the screen. Um, and, and, thank and thank you so much for being here today. I, I thought this was all a very insightful um, conversation. I know that I personally learned a lot. Um, I hope that our audience, our global audience, also was able to take quite a bit away from this and even like go into the rest of our days um, and the rest of the year really thinking about these concepts of inclusion, of uh, sort of thinking about why and how it is that we display certain information um, and uh, how we can sort of make our, the tools that we use more accessible for um, international and global audiences and communities. Um, so thank you, of course, to all of our speakers, Caleb, Zahira, um, Zandre, and now. Um, thank you to the Good Patch team, um, Lissy, who was representing the, the Munich studio, Alex, who was helping us look like more than your average Zoom call. Um, also, speaking of sparking interest, um, Alex has been doing Design Dad, which if you have kids who are sitting at home driving you absolutely nuts, um, Alex has been doing um, an intro to design class for kids, also on Twitch. Um, also, Felix, uh, who was a moderator and has always been a part of Product Crunch, and also Monica, um, who is our honorary Product Crunch uh, team member. Um, also, thank you to Adobe XD for sponsoring this. I guess we'll find out soon enough if anyone, A, participated in who won. Uh, what a missed opportunity if you didn't sort of try to grab this uh, creative cloud subscription. And of course, thank you to Good Patch for investing in community and letting us spend quite a bit of time doing events like this. Um, so if you have any questions, comments, concerns, if you have any questions for our speakers that you weren't able to ask, if you have any ideas about how we can make these events, especially our remote events, better, please send me an email. You can email me at maya, M-A-Y-A, at goodpatch.com. You can also send me love notes. I love a love note. Um, so let's see. The winner of the Adobe Creative Cloud subscription um, is, uh, I think it's, is it Michelle Shoshman? And I totally butchered your name. I'm so sorry. Um, but yeah, Michelle. Anyway, we'll send you a message through LinkedIn 
Um, and yeah, enjoy your subscription. And I hope you send us images of all the fun things that you make on Adobe XD. So again, thank you all. Um, thank you for your donations. And unfortunately, I can't drop the mic, but that's it. <laughs> so bye, everyone. <laughs>